Friends, before we hear God's word, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this season, the season of Christmas, that we can celebrate Jesus' birth. We thank you for sending your Son into the world, that we might believe in him, and because we believe in him, that we might have eternal life. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gospel message brought to us by not just the angel, but by your Son. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter and our guide, our helper to reveal to us the truth and understanding of the gospel. So Lord, this morning we pray for you to open up our eyes and open up our ears and widen our hearts to receive and understand and also to obey we pray in jesus name amen
Friends, four weeks ago, on um, the first Sunday of Advent, I asked you this question. Wouldn't it be great if we were visited by an angel this Christmas? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were given a special message from God this Christmas? Because if an angel did come and visit with you, it would have changed everything. Um, it would have woken us up from this pandemic stupor that uh, all of us are in. Not only would the angel's appearance uh, and message have changed our Christmas, I dare say it would have changed up our lives as well. We only have to look uh, at the angel's um, appearances to these people uh, post-angel encounter why Zechariah was completely changed and Mary was changed and so were the shepherds changed. So, did any one of you receive a visit from an angel this Christmas? You know, I'm, I'm not really joking by asking that question. I'm deadly serious because we still believe that God employs his angels to speak to his people. And if God did speak to you a word uh, that you can share, uh, we would be so eager as a congregation to hear what God has spoken to you. It would be a blessing. But in the absence of an actual angel visitation to any of us uh, this Christmas, we have still learned a lot, haven't we, from the angel's visit to Zechariah, to Mary, and to the shepherds. And from this morning's scripture reading, uh, we know of the angel's visits to Joseph. What have we learned? Well, we've learned um, that the message of the angel was primarily about Jesus' birth. Now, all of the details of Jesus' birth were very, very important. The message to Zechariah uh, was that his son, his son to be born, John, uh, John would become the preparer for the way of the Lord. And the message to Mary, her son to be born, would be Jesus himself. And then the message to the shepherds was that God had given to them uh, a Savior, Jesus. So all of these uh, details uh, of the narrative uh, were very important because they formed the basis of the gospel by which we are saved. For example, the coming of Jesus, um, we know now, was an act of God. His birth was not the decision of uh, any human parents, but that he originated from God. The person of Jesus himself, uh, Jesus is, was unique. He was fully God and fully human. Uh, he uh, grew up like any human being, but at the same time, he was fully divine having been supernaturally conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the mission of Jesus, that, that mission to communicate God's offer of salvation to everyone on earth, to save everyone who believed in him. Uh, that's why uh, his name is God Saves. And furthermore, his life was the agency of that salvation uh, by means of his death on the cross. And because he died on the cross, he fulfilled his other name, Emmanuel, God at one with us. So every part of the nativity, every detail of the narrative, everything that took place, all of it was a fulfillment of God's plan since, since creation, since Genesis 3.15. And thus the nativity then becomes the foundation of our gospel, the gospel by which we are saved. So it is true that the good news concerning Jesus was the primary message of the Christmas angel. But in the angel's appearances, we also learned a lot about whom the Lord sent his angel to and why God favored them. Let me repeat that. From the angel's work, we learned about whom the Lord chose uh, to send his angel to and why God favored them. In Zechariah's story, uh, we learn that God favored people who are faithful, who are faithful in prayer and serving. 
uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth both served their entire lives uh, the Lord. From Mary's story, we learned that the Lord favored people who were humble and obedient. And from the shepherd's story, the Lord favored people who were open and responsive. What about today? The angel's appearances to Joseph. What can we learn? Well, we learned that the Lord favored people who were faithful to the law and faithful also to love at others at the same time. But before we get to that, let me, um, um, let me point out two curious um, observations about the angel's appearances to Joseph that was different from the angel's appearances to Zechariah, to Mary, and to the shepherds. The angel appeared um, to Joseph how many times? The angel appeared to Joseph three times. Okay. And how did the angel appear to Joseph? The text says the angel appeared to Joseph in his dreams. All three times Joseph was sleeping. And while he was asleep, God appeared to him. I've uh, lagged in my slides, so let me advance to, to the slides um, Friends, I want to suggest to you and to me, to us this morning, uh, that God's appearances uh, in our sleep, through our dreams, might be more common, uh, might be more likely uh, than you think. Um, because, you know what, everybody sleeps, <laughs> everybody dreams. And um, while you may go through your entire life uh, not having seen one single angel, um, we have the potential to see and to hear God speak to us almost every, every night. In fact, um, uh, dreams are, you know what dreams are. There are visions or images that occur to us when we are in um, the REM stage of sleep. There, there are many stages of sleep. You could have light, a non-REM sleep. You could have deep non-REM sleep. REM just means rapid eye movement sleep. And uh, most dreams occur when we are in our REM sleep. Doctors know a lot about sleeping and dreaming. Um, they know, for example, that everybody dreams between um, uh, ar averagely around two hours a night. And each dream is around um, uh, between five minutes or 20 minutes. Uh, doctors know that uh, when you're dreaming, you are motionless, you're paralyzed. Um, the phenomenon is known as atonia, which prevents you from acting out your dreams. Uh, but we know some people uh, who are more paralyzed than others, I, I, I want to say. And uh, we also know that uh, doctors know that there is evidence of universal dreams. For example, um, uh, have you dreamt flying dreams or falling dreams or Dreams where you're being chased or when you are late for something. So doctors know a lot about dreams and uh, sleep, but they know less about why we dream. Do you know why you dream? What's the purpose of dreams? Well, there are these four um, generally accept theories. Uh, the first one is uh, dreams as self-therapy. Um, so... When we dream, we are uh, at a higher emotional level than when we are conscious, when we're awake. And therefore, our brains uh, may make connections between our feelings, our emotions, and the events um, uh, that uh, when we're conscious, we're not able to or that we can't make. Uh, secondly, dreams... Uh, Another theory for dreams is uh, fight or flight training. This is the, the body's natural way of preparing us to deal with some crisis. Uh, so uh, the, the part of our brain, the amygdala, is active, very active when we're dreaming. And so um, researchers have uh, posed this idea that when we're dreaming, we are actually, the body is actually training us um, 
for some fight or flight training. And um, dreams uh, could be our muse or our, our inspiration. Artists of all kinds have uh, credited their dreams to come up with some of their best work. And you may have as well. You wake up one morning and uh, during your sleep you had an idea and you wake up with this idea or you wake up with um, a song or a movie script or in my case I might wake up with a sermon idea. See, um, during our uh, awake time we just have this logical brain um, but when we are sleeping um, none of that um, restrictions uh, uh, is, is present. Our creative juices then can flow. Um, so when we're dreaming, we're actually doing some very creative work. Another theory, the fourth theory, uh, is that dreams uh, serve as our memory aids. If you're learning anything new, for example, uh, so researchers have found that when you uh, sleep on it, you're going to remember more because when you sleep, uh, your brain kind of sorts out the important memories from the not important memories. And so uh, we know that if you're cramming for an exam and you don't sleep, uh, it doesn't work as well as when you've studied and then you sleep and uh, your recall is a lot better. Friends, there is um, a fifth theory that I want to posit to us, and that is dreams can be opportunities for God to speak to us. Dreams as messages from God. Perhaps it's because um, during our awake hours, um, we, we tend to be so busy, so preoccupied, so distracted that God has not even a chance to get in a word edgewise. And we tend to forget God. We tend to uh, put him aside and... Um, Perhaps it's because so few of us actually take up God's Word, the Bible, open up its pages and read and hence get God's Word into us. God has to wait or God might wait until we are totally immobilized, lying on our back or on our side, as it were. And um, we, are, we can't run anywhere. Uh, he has our undivided attention. Our guard is down and then he is able to sleep he, he is able to speak to us. And uh, for everyone, everyone has to sleep sometime and everyone dreams. So this might potentially be a very effective way for God to speak to us. And I say potential because it depends on you, whether you want God to speak to you. I want to uh, say to you that dreams might be one of the most common ways that God speaks to me. Early in the morning, uh, before I fully awake, I'm lying there in bed, warm and comfy. I have uh, oftentimes this experience of being in conversation with someone, and that someone I believe to be God. I may be asking a question, I may be posing a, an idea or a thought, and I, I, I'm discussing it. Uh, almost, uh, as it were, with the Lord. And um, some mornings I, I get something in my mind and it's so vivid, I have to wake up. I don't want to wake up, but I have to because when I wake up, I put something on quickly, I run downstairs, I open up my laptop, or I take out a pen and paper and I start writing. And uh, uh, this week, why am I preaching this week? This is supposed to be Pastor James this week. Um, but uh, I had this message and I felt I really needed to share it with you today. Consider the dreams that um, uh, Joseph had, the three dreams that were given by God to the angel to him. The first dream, Joseph, the, the angel said, Joseph, take Mary as your wife. And the second dream, um, the angel said, Joseph, take Jesus and Mary and escape to Egypt. And in the third dream, Joseph, take Jesus and Mary and return to Israel. Now, the first dream um, uh, involved a lifetime commitment to marry uh, someone that Joseph had some questions about. 
I mean, he wasn't sure whether Mary was telling him the truth or not, why she got pregnant. And the second message uh, was no less troubling. Uh, this was a message for Joseph to get up in the middle of the night, pack the most essential items for the family, and then as stealthily as they could escape from Bethlehem, journey uh, into the night in the desert and go all the way to Egypt and uh, uh, become refugees. Um, and then in the third message, uh, Joseph heard he was to uproot his family again and leave Egypt and go all the way to Nazareth. He would have to find a new job, find a new place to live, uh, trust God all over again. These were all life-changing, life-altering, significant dreams. Now, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. If you had these dreams, would you act on them? I mean, they're huge. Uh, I'm reminded of this movie. Um, can you tell who this is and which movie? Um, this is Tom Cruise, and uh, this movie it was Jerry Maguire. That's right. One night, um, Jerry Maguire was up. He was up all night. And uh, perhaps after uh, uh, a pizza or, or beer, he couldn't sleep. He was up all night and he was writing this manifesto. And during the night, this manifesto uh, made all the sense in the world. But in the morning, he wasn't so sure. And that, that was what the movie was about. So sometimes you hear something in your dream and it makes sense. And then you wake up and you wonder, was that really God speaking to me or... Did I just make that up? Can I trust this word? Can I actually make some life-changing decisions based on what God said in my dreams? How do we know that the message that you receive in your sleep was from God? That it wasn't just some fantasy that you dreamt about? Uh, a farmer was standing in his field, surveying his field, looking out there. And he looked up into the sky and uh, he saw what, what the clouds were, um, were in this strange formation. They looked like the letters P and C. And he was thinking about it, ruminating about it, thinking some more on it. And then he finally thought he had a word from God, P, C, P, C. It meant preach Christ. Wow, he thought, I'm going to have to sell my farm, uh, leave farming, enroll in seminary, and be trained as an evangelist. So he quickly ran home and uh, excitedly shared his revelation from God with his wife. And um, uh, his wife, being a very supportive and loving wife, uh, decided to hear him out from beginning to end without any interruption. And then the farmer asked his wife, so what do you think? PC, preach Christ? And that uh, the wife calmly and gently said, are you sure that PC didn't mean plant corn? If God were to speak to you, uh, tonight in a dream. How can you be sure that PC uh, means preach Christ and not plant corn? How can you be sure that PC didn't mean uh, by president's choice or be co politically correct? Isn't that what's holding us back from obeying sometimes? We have a message and we are not sure, and because we're not sure, we don't obey. We don't respond. How was Joseph so sure? Wouldn't we also like to be just as decisive and deliberate and bold and immediate in our obedience? Let me read to you this uh, passage again. Uh, from Matthew 1, 18 and 19. This is how the birth of Jesus, the, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before 
they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And get this, here are two insights about how Joseph was so sure that the messages that he received were from God. And the insights are in this verse, verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Did you spot the two insights from the text that actually help us to be sure that what we're hearing is from God? The first insight is faithfulness to God's law. Are you faithful to God's law? Because Joseph, it says clearly, was faithful to the law. The priority of Joseph's life was to live authentically in accordance with God's law, God's will, and God's word. He was ready to do whatever it took in order to please God. He lived his life in such a way as to always put himself in a position in right relationship with God. And, and because that was his priority, that was the way he lived, it's highly likely that the things that Joseph thinks God is saying to him are really from God and not from himself. Now, in contrast, um, many of us live our lives with us being the uh, priority. We are sitting on the throne of our lives. We are concerned only about pleasing ourselves. And why, why, why do we do what we do? Uh, we do what we do because it's expedient for us. It benefits us. It profits us. We think this is the right thing to do. And uh, where is God in all of this? Well, often God is left aside. God is in the background. God doesn't enter into our picture. If that's the case, um, no wonder we cannot trust the things that we hear because likely they're, they're not from God. They're just from us because we are, um, uh, we sit on the throne of our lives. We call the shots. Likely these messages are not from God. They're from the world because we, we depend and trust the world much more than we do God. And if you are faithful to God's law um, and, and God's word, um, that the messages that come to you, um, you want to kind of filter them through um, um, God's word. So are, are the messages that come to you aligned with God's word? And uh, Joseph was able to evaluate uh, the messages that came to him uh, because they lined up with what Mary said God said to her. And they lined up with what the Bible, the Torah, actually not the Torah, but from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. So what the angel said to Joseph, Joseph was able to process that, filter that through his knowledge of God's word. And because Joseph wanted to be faithful to God's law, the messages aligned with God's word. And, and that's why he was assured that they were from God. I hope you're still with me. So that's the first insight, faithfulness to God's law. The second insight um, is in verse 19 again. Joseph was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. The and yet figure is most prominently here. The author was trying to differentiate Joseph's uh, keeping of the law, uh, how he differed in that keeping of the law. So Joseph was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. Uh, other people in being faithful to the law might have denounced uh, Mary, um, declare that Mary was guilty of adultery. Other people who keep the law might have uh, renounced Mary, formally declared um, his dissolution of his engagement to Mary. But not Joseph. 
Joseph was, faith, Joseph was faithful to the law, and yet, the and yet clause qualified his faithfulness to the law, that he was faithful to the law, and at the same time, he was equally faithful uh, to loving others. In, in this case, loving Mary. And he didn't want to expose Mary to public humiliation, to the consequence uh, of, um, of adultery, um, that other people might uh, not understand the situation, and then Mary would be in, in big trouble. We all need to be faithful to God's law, but at the same time, we also need to balance upholding the law with our love for others. Friends, isn't this um, how Jesus uh, spoke of the greatest commandment? Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The first and the second commandment, love God, love neighbor. Everything else hangs or hinges on these two commandments. Uh, in, in another passage in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, and also 21, um, that this is reinforce this teaching. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And God has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You see how keeping the law and loving others goes hand in hand? Do you recall the story uh, uh, of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery? Uh, the group of Pharisees were ready to stone this woman. And uh, because Jesus was perfect in law-keeping and perfect in loving others, he did not cast any stones, uh, nor did he condemn. He had a heart full of compassion on the woman caught in sin and the consequences of adultery. At the same time, Jesus called the accusers to account and because they too realized their own sin, they did not cast any stones either. Friends, I believe as Christians, uh, disciples of Jesus, we're going to be tested over and over again in this regard, faithfulness to the law and faithfulness to loving others, being as compassionate as Jesus was and being as perfect in keeping the law as Jesus did. I believe these two qualities, love God by loving God's law and love others as you love yourself. Uh, these two qualities help Joseph be assured that the messages that he heard in his dreams were from God. Uh, dreams are uh, a potential uh, opportunity for God to speak to you. And as I said before, I believe that you're more likely to hear God speak to you in your dream than you are to see an angel. Um, but it depends on you. Do you really want this? And does your faithfulness to the law um, and your faithfulness to loving others uh, that quality will help you discern whether the messages that you received are from God. Friends, have you been visited by an angel this Christmas? Um, even if you didn't, even if you weren't, <coughs> excuse me, visited by an angel, potentially God can speak to you through your dreams. You know, in in the, the Bible, we, uh, a lot more ink was spilled on Mary. We know a lot more about what Mary did all through uh, Jesus' life. Uh, but we know very little about Joseph. We, we only know uh, basically these three passages that we read this morning. 
Um, but, but Joseph had a very pivotal, pivotal role in Jesus' earthly life. And he, Joseph, fulfilled that role faithfully, faithfully. He provided for his family. He loved his family. He kept them, he protected them. He kept them from harm. And uh, Joseph did that all uh, through following God's law and being faithful, being compassionate. And uh, Joseph heard multiple times from God through his dreams. Uh, wouldn't we also like to be like Joseph, to be hearing from God and being bold and decisive in how we protect our family, how we lead our family, and how we serve God by responding obediently. God wants to lead and direct your life. Uh, he wants to speak to you. And um, uh, the big idea from this message, I believe, is that God will lead you to live a great life, uh, just as Joseph did. Joseph led a great life. God will lead you to live a great life if you are faithful to his law and to loving others. God will lead you to live a great life if you are faithful to his law and to loving others. In truth, uh, there are many, many messages that God gives to us. Uh, but how many of those messages uh, were effective? I mean, that you actually understood, heard, and then responded obediently. You know, all through this pandemic, um, uh, I know in my family, uh, we've ordered takeout. And every time we order takeout, we are left with these takeout containers. And I don't know about you, but I've become a hoarder of... Uh, really nice takeout containers. Um, uh, the, the, the takeout containers, which I think are really nice, are from Kanji Queen. Uh, they are the different sizes, but they all stack up nicely. They clean nicely. They're sturdy. In fact, I've gotten rid of all other subpar um, takeout containers, and uh, I've only kept these nice ones. But as the pandemic has gone on, uh, longer, I've, I've, I've gotten so many of them. Now, the idea, uh, the, the joy isn't in keeping the containers, it is filling these containers with, like, food. You know, better yet, to cook food, put them in these containers, and then give them as gifts to other people. Same like the messages that we receive from God. Uh, a lot of us are hoarders of God's messages and they just sit in the drawer collecting dust uh, because we have not obeyed and responded in obedience to these messages. What's the big idea? God will lead you to live a great life if you are faithful <clears throat> to loving him by following his law and loving others as you love yourself. All the other commandments hang on these two. Friends, this word is preached in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Let me just give you a moment of silence to, to reflect on what you have heard. Would you like to hear from God? tonight when you are sleeping. God can speak to you, you know, through your dreams. And perhaps it's, it's just by making a commitment right now in this prayer that you would be committed to being faithful to God's law. Or maybe it's being committed, equally committed, to loving others, being compassionate. These two qualities, if you keep these two qualities, you are keeping the greatest commandments, Jesus said, were ever given by God. Love God, love others. 
these two qualities will help you discern that the messages that you receive, perhaps in your dreams, perhaps when you're awake, that they are from God. And if you know that these are from God, you can respond in obedience. Heavenly Father, come and help us follow you. Come and help us hear what you are saying to us. Lord, at the end of 2020, help us take this step of growth in our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.